Over the years, I've made plenty of videos covering Cartoon Network's classic output of animation, mainly from the early years and transitional years, however. But everywhere I've turned, I've heard it. Once the 2010s rolled around, CN got a second wind, pumping out modern hit after modern hit. Not everything worked for everyone all the time, but it was a startling renaissance fans of all ages lived in the moment for. So instead of reviewing any of the heavy hitters, I landed on one of the small fries. But maybe it isn't the worst of its time, just the fastest. Mighty Magiswords isn't considered this big shining achievement of 2010's animation. At most, just a fun little cartoon to enjoy in bite-sized morsels. That's the key, bite-sized, because it has a reputation for being very manic. Always on the move, no time to breathe, just the funny parts. And I have to wonder if that's a fair generalization of the whole show. Probably not, it can't be all the time, right? There had to be some slower moments that let you take in the world and know what the characters are really like. I'm happy to report that there are, but how much zaniness do you have to take in first? If zaniness includes a mandatory history lesson a lot, the creator of Mighty Magic Swords, Kyle A. Carosa, grew up with a deep interest in Looney Tunes, especially the work of Bob Clampett. By the time he graduated the Art Institute of Philadelphia in 1999, he was getting some minor gigs on projects big and small, but had big plans for his own creative prospects. If you ever feel like your career in animation isn't going anywhere, have a couple show concepts in your pocket. One of these was Moo Beard the Cow Pirate, which he created for Nickelodeon's Random Cartoons project around 2005, but it was delayed to 2008 because of course it was. After Moo Beard, his next big idea was Dungeons and Day Jobs, centering around a sibling duo of warriors for hire that he had created in the mid-90s. At one point, he thought of making it for adults, and I really wish someone had the foresight to see this could have been big in that time and that tone. Not that I'm disappointed with the final product, but you'll soon see it takes a lot of influence from Nintendo games from the NES and Super Nintendo era, and nostalgia for that era was booming in the mid to late 2000s. Alas, the call of fanboy and chum chum and fish hooks was beckoning, just beckoning. Dungeons and Day Jobs eventually materialized at Cartoon Network Studios in 2015 under the name Mighty Magiswords. It started as a series of online shorts for the Cartoon Network app on May 6th, and after building enough momentum, premiered as a full TV series on September 29th, 2016. The significance of cultural events on our lives and how they help us craft eras is up to interpretation and debate. But here it is, the first post-Harambe show I've covered on this channel. I know, it's barely cutting it for an old show, but what can I say, it's already a reflection of an era. Ratings were eh, critical reception was eh, its treatment by the network was ah, but most importantly, they knew the future of entertainment lay online, for better or worse. Season 2 was mostly screened early on Cartoon Network's website, with its last couple episodes being uploaded on August 23rd, 2018, leaving basically no fanfare when they closed out their run on television on May 17th, 2019. Yes, this is also one of the first shows to have still been airing when I started doing these animated series reviews. Am I getting old? No, you're just getting young. What's with this trash bash, you guys? It's a week's worth of our film! I'm not proud of it, but it is impressive, no? How are you two even alive? In the medieval land of... Ugh, what is this name? Siblings Prahias and Vamba Warrior have set up a business called Warriors for Hire, where they help people with their errands and quests using their budding collection of magiswords. Those are large handheld tools with hundreds of funky gimmicks which the Warriors have been collecting since they were kids, being the children of humble broccoli farmers. It's a legend of strength, courage, and action, but not wisdom. The Warriors are quite dense, and so are their many allies and adversaries. But is it fun to watch them fight and fumble? Vamba is the older sister and the most level-headed of the two by a hair. You can tell by her inexplicable British accent. She's also quite obsessive over her interests, which can occasionally lead to trouble. Not helping is her brain slash imaginary friend slash devil on her shoulder staring her in a sneaky direction. Welcome to Mighty Magiswords. This show is weird. Her younger brother, Prahias, is the more feisty and impulsive of the two, not needing an imaginary friend to make him act before thinking. Together, they have a sibling dynamic that works well enough, 
where sometimes they're at each other's throats, but they're mostly two peas in a pod. One of the only Magiswords that can talk to them is Pumpkin Magisword, but he's got a very quiet, mumbly voice with a personality to match. Good choice to give a character, I think. They have a pet dragon called Grup, who coasts by with Dopey Charm. The voice is your standard dumb guy voice, but he's competent enough to have a friend group in his dungeon of noobs. Outside their home is a world of weirdos, including Squirt, a Bostonian witch they knew in school who's barely scraping by now. I think it was smart and nice of the creative team to add a fairly realistic and relevant depiction of young adulthood. Okay, her knowing magic isn't realistic, but you can get behind her over-eager personality traits. Norville is the local librarian and shares Vamba's passion for a series of mystery books, even if it isn't always perfect. They become boyfriend and girlfriend with time and patience, but you might want to know what Norville's personality is like. Meek and friendly. The warriors have a set of rivals too, Morbidia and Gateau. Morbidia is a mean, snobby witch with great facial expressions of nothing else, and Gateau is a human-sized cat and sort of like her lackey. Decent rivals and always put on a show. The ruler of the land of Riboflabin is Princess Zanj, a pretty chill side of royalty with a 2010s valley girl accent and a good rapport with the warriors. She's alright. They needed some sort of royal for this world, I guess. Ralphio is the merchant the warriors get most of their magic swords from, despite how pricey he makes them. He can be funny, but I can never shake the voice. It's good that Doug Lawrence is still getting work outside of Spongebob, but he's literally doing the Plankton voice for Ralphio. And I don't usually get distracted by that sort of thing, but it really is distracting here. You also have Pachydermis Picard, their grouchy landlord. I guess they needed every corner of their life banged out to keep the setting immersive, including a soft-spoken apple girl we all have in our lives. There's also a thief going around, Phil, a Spanish-sounding nomad who always gets in trouble in the end, but he never lets it break his spirit. I don't know if you should be more like Phil or less like Phil, but he's there. Some other allies made along the way are some rabbits, Hoppus and his ex-rival Denelda. Hoppus has this sort of cold, introverted air to him, but I think with the limited screen time they gave Denelda, there was a better arc of becoming more outgoing and approachable. No Hyas is Pro Hyas's strange doppelganger who likes to pop in and try to steal the show. He falls into the camp of being so random it's funny. He's given no introduction whenever he's around, and you never know what he's up to. Last of all, going below even No Hyas is Fishman, some French guy who lives underwater and sometimes fights the warriors. I'm amused by the fact that Kyle Carosa actually designed him as a Mega Man robot master for a Nintendo Power Contest in the early 90s, and decided to use him in an entirely different production all that time later. I guess that's the thrilling backstory he's always eager to tell. The side characters get increasingly jokey, so I figured this is a good place to stop, and let you gather that this is already a very quirky cast. Cut me, sir! If you could take a moment of my precious time, I'd love to introduce you to this amazing new... <laughs> yeah! The show is fast. Really fast. The most common complaint you'll get about Mighty Magic Swords is with the pacing. If you watch the main series episodes from the beginning, instead of being eased into the world, you'll be bombarded with information, shoved into the ice-cold pool that is loud narration, whiplash-inducing scene transitions, and shots that can last less than half a second. To the average newcomer, this can be pretty overwhelming, having to take this all in at the speed the show is going and come back next week. But maybe you can get into this show if you have a short attention span. There is the unspoken hypothesis that entertainment has been gradually getting more fast-paced to keep up with our attention, but it's still plain to see that Mighty Magic Swords is pretty far to the right of the bell curve. Something I was happy to see from the beginning was a heavy Nintendo influence, specifically from their 80s and 90s output. This fact is going to shock you, there's a noticeable overlap between animators and Nintendo fans. Mad, I know. But it's easy to see that Kyle and the Magic Swords creative staff were big fans of classic game franchises like The Legend of Zelda and Mega Man, because they do anything they can to sneak a little reference to them here and there for the gamers. That at least guarantees that fans of those games will be curious to what's going on here. And the animation is good for what it is. 2010's Flash animation trying for a loose and zany Spumco-esque look. It seemed challenging, but I like the final result well enough. The faces especially can get really weird, like it seems as though they were super proud of each face they could get themselves to draw. 
Before long, you're going to notice they're relying on the He-Man effect, of having a stock animation for the pre-battle stances that they constantly reuse. But the stances are strong enough for you to get through quickly, and they were updated for Season 2. But hold on, I haven't even talked about Season 1 yet. Hello, Warrior siblings, Vamber and Prohias. Oh, it has been years. It's been exactly Fuck. years, actually. It's going to surprise you to know that despite everything being relentlessly zippy, Mighty Magic Swords actually had a clear continuity from the beginning. Even the online shorts found a backstory for Vamber and Prohias right before the show started. We get a couple flashbacks to their time at the Academy, and they make plenty of mentions regarding their broccoli farmer heritage. In fact, broccoli is this show's funny food. Of all the information I could process from this show, why did it have to be a vegetable? This is one of those shows where the setting is also important to the jokes, so they had to head out as much as they could. They're warriors, of course they travel the land to do all the gritty battling a Y7 rating can let them do. But they have to be out in the world in strange locations, like a dinosaur land, an ice land, barren plains, plenty of voyages into the ocean, and in a special two-parter, a futuristic robot world. It seemed like an odd thing to bring up, since most cartoons feature a lot of travelling and new locations and we just accept it, but with a show like this, it really helps distinguishing the episodes. Just catching a glimpse of one background while channel surfing will remind you of what happened there. It becomes essential in making sure the craziness doesn't all blend together. This is quickly turning into a negative tangent, so onward and upward to season two. <laughs> it's the new rock and stick app. Wanna try? Uh, all right, all right, hold on. This was a season mostly designed for core fans, those who had immersed themselves in the show and were looking for a more heightened Mighty Magiswords experience. Most of it didn't even debut on television, this wasn't for the casuals. But I don't think there would have been any harm in making it that way. I think season 2 was a slightly better package than the first, mainly because it addresses some of the biggest flaws of its predecessor. The pace is way more manageable. Scenes are given time to say something about the world or the characters. The arcs are a little more fulfilling. It seems like they've changed by the end of an episode, even if with the nature of these sorts of gag shows, character development is going to be inconsistent if ever attempted. They do an episode about Prohias' whining tick, but he still does it even more after the fact. Great they acknowledged it, and also great in an ironic you're getting entertainment out of me being mad at it sort of way that they continue doing this. Still, there's more things to prefer season 2 for, like these little chibi scenes at the end of every episode, completely superfluous, but a nice way to show how dynamic these characters are. They cared more about the characters than the adventure this season, and that's a sign they were starting to grow on the creative team. What unique label am I going to give the best episodes list? A well-deserved one. These are the 10 that och. Changeable to rangeable puts our occasionally lovable heroes in a shifting maze. Always had a thing for this setup. Mazes are a cool place to set action, and it was considerate of the writers to make this an exercise in teamwork. Pachydermis Picard and the Camp of Fantasy feels like pranking the teacher on the last day of school. It's a later episode where the warriors finally just put their grouchy landlord through the kind of training they have to endure, and it's really cathartic. Thelonious Prose is an early and simple romp about Vamba getting worked up over a Veronica Victorious fanfiction. It's going so high because it's one of the first to not feel like an online short stretched out for 10 minutes. It's got enough material to justify its length. Continue taps into that fear all gamers have of having to lose lives and repeat frustrating moments, all piled onto Vamba as she has to deal with time continuously reversing around her. They had a lot of good ideas for this one, they essentially had it in the bag. Agent of Destruction is your bog standard getting rich and famous shindig, but it works for these underdog protagonists. Plus, there's a weird sense of irony that these episodes are usually created to reflect a show's growing popularity, but since Mighty Magiswords never really became a household name, the episode has to stand on its own merits, and I think it does. Suitable Armor is one long dress-up montage as Vamba's fashion sense is finally questioned. Female warrior fashion in media was getting a lot less skimpy around this time, so they had to think of some way to justify her hatred of pants. I don't think they did, but what we got was funny. Random Acts of Memory is our big no hire spotlight, where he goes from an annoying weirdo to some omnipotent parasite having wormed his way into the lore. I think I know enough about him now, thank you very much. 
quest for knowledge made a great season 1 finale. It feels like everything came together, with all the academy teams having a different reason to get the most powerful Magisword yet, and you even get some lore for Vamba's brain. Sadly, we never know why the green earrings look more like fins on her. The Incredible Tiny Warriors isn't exactly what it sounds like. They go to a land of giants and are in danger of being devoured by some giant Elvis cat. Vamba peers into the depths of the internet. I'll just say that much. My favourite episode is the saga of Robopege, where the warrior's adorable robotic swine is on the fritz so they have to go to a cybernetic world to save him. This place is gorgeous enough to land the episode high on the list, but it seems the story is finally taking itself seriously, with stakes high and the action unpredictable. And since it's half an hour long and still in that hectic season 1 mode, the worst thing you can say about it passive-aggressively is that it's dense. But you know what else is dense? These eight ocking failures. Doki and Buford's decidedly pathetic journey, I care about these two, why? They're just tertiary characters that didn't need to be hoisted into the spotlight, so no wonder most of this is deliberately aimless. Ghosh had a pretty boastful title that it can't live up to. It's mostly about Prahaya's trying to ride a stubborn goat, and the middle portion is very long and very monotonous. Bad, bad cop sees the warriors go a little mad with power. With this and the rest of the worst list, the problem usually is the pace making it hard to keep justifying character motivations. Not good for this kind of story. Dungeons and Day Jobs is the warriors' big chance to go in debt and work at a fast food joint, Slug Burger. They botch it. Not a high recommendation from me. Extreme Dreams has a deceptively intriguing title, but it's mostly just action sequences with an excuse plot. The title let me down on my first watch, but from then on, it was the underwhelming story and overemphasis on stunts. Get That Borfal introduces these little creatures to the royal spa to the annoyance of the characters. Just another excuse plot gag fest that may not sound that bad, but all it wants to accomplish is destruction. Cleanliness's next to gruffness is an early one, so it's at an unfair disadvantage. But still, it's a wacky misunderstanding that could be sorted out in two minutes, not ten. Sorry, Grupp. My least favourite episode is surely Eugesto, where they acquire this hypnotic magisword that gets them to cause a destructive ruckus, a keen metaphor for the weakest this show has to offer. I only made this worst list so long because of tradition, not because that many of these lower tier episodes were substantial enough to criticise in depth, but I'll nominate Surely You Jesto as an episode you should watch for a taste of what Mighty Magiswords can get wrong on a bad day. But overall, I found this show to be serviceable. It's got some good episodes, characters and moments, and that's enough for some people. This is still a pretty new show, but I have to wonder if any of my younger viewers have any fond, wistful memories of tuning into Mighty Magiswords as youngins. Maybe it'll get more popular with time. Yes, the credits theme is already over. It's a show that has some silly moments out of context, so I could see that being someone's introduction to it. As it stands, I'm just thankful for the episodes that are as thrilling as Manfish's backstory, which as you know, is the Infinity and beyond!